So, that's me, Robin. I have a confession to make. I am a recovering Allianz sales agent. But don't worry, I've been clean for over six years. But before um, you know, I shared something with me, now I want to know something from you. Who of you would um, say about himself, he or she is sporty, athletic, has run a half marathon or a marathon or something like that? Anybody? Ah, all right, you know, back there, so? Uh, keep going. Keep going? Yeah. And uh, what would you recommend a person like me, who's not very uh, athletic, to become athletic? Uh, don't run a full marathon, but start with half one. Okay, so train also a little yeah, bit. Yeah. So, and I think it's the same as digital transformation. Um, you, there are people and companies out there that are super successful in this field, um, and they have done a few things to achieve this. And as in sport, and as we have shared uh, right away, um, in, I think also in digital transformation, we just need to do the stuff the uh, successful digital companies um, are doing it. And I will share the five secrets, um, what I think uh, is a factor here. And uh, what is Digital Scouting? Actually, we are a content platform with uh, 60,000 fans, millions views uh, each month. And it started as a small blog. It exploded um, also due to uh, people in this room. Um, and um, why did people follow us? We scouted a small um, Israeli-American startup and said this, was, this will be big and it became Lemonade. We gathered some uh, evidence for Amazon entering the space. Um, so we were, we were two times right, of course. We were 27,000 times wrong, but the people remember the two times. So that was very good for us. And um, what is our mission? Our, our mission is to support the good in the industry because despite my rants on stage, um, I think we have a lot of good in our industry. People who want to move forward, bring the industry forward and, and do innovative things, push innovation. I think innovation is just a synonym for survival and um, that's what our, our mission is um, as, as a content platform. Um, yeah, maybe maybe two more words. I really started as an Allianz sales agent, so it's not just a joke to answer, um, to start a talk, um, but I also went to the internal departments and did transformation projects in large and smaller insurers. So I know the craziness in the field out there of selling insurances and the uh, challenges internally, I think uh, you guys all know too. Um, and I went to a startup when a startup wasn't cool yet. Um, and actually my boss back then at Allianz told me, and to which department are you changing? I'm like, no, 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 I'm, I'm leaving. Uh, and this startup uh, went from zero to 1,200 people, was sold for a gazillion euros. I did not have any equity in it, so I still need to work. Um, then I went to a mid-sized German insurer, uh, insure, and that was horrible. Um, and then I went to a private bank and we built a digital product with over a billion assets under information, scaling like crazy. Again, no equity in the company. Again, I still need to work. So people do the mistakes sometimes once, I do it twice. So everybody who's laughing has done this mistake obviously too. So when do people cause very quickly? And so uh, I always say, um, you know, I'm not a public speaker, I just speak in public. We actually have a real business. Um, and we do three things. We help insurers with digital products and services because we have built products in the past that were super successful in other industries. Um, we get called um, when they want trend research because we have a network of influencers and thought leaders around the world who give us use cases you don't get out of a McKinsey database. Um, and um, we do also um, attention hacking, so how to become more known in the market, how to make a customer come to you. So but that's enough advertisement. Um, we're going to talk about this, about attention, why is attention shifting and why is this actually a gigantic opportunity. Um, I will talk about the need for speed. It's not about my um, poor performance on this uh, computer game, but it's concerned the, 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 what, what does it mean for the industry. Then I say, don't be agile. I thought I say something contrast to the host that invited me. So uh, I'm not, I'm probably not going to be here next year. Um, <laughs> then I'm going to tell you something about apps and then why, why content is king um, and why it's so important. My question to you is how many times a year are you in contact with your customer? Okay, nobody wants to share company secrets. On a daily basis, okay, you, you are. But I have friends uh, uh, who are in an industry and they say we are in contact with our customer once every three years or one even said once every eight years. And how many times, there was just a study coming out, um, how many 
advertisement messages do we receive every single day? What do you think? Do you have a number in mind? Uh, well, I think uh, 100. 100, okay. That's a lot. Anything more and more or less? 1,000? I couldn't believe the number myself when I saw it. It's 10,000 advertisement messages each single day. What does it mean when we send, send our um, messages? Um, that's of course um, 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 not enough. And why is this so important? It's important because we need the attention of the customer. We can have the best product in the world, the best service, if the customer does not know our um, pr product um, and we don't have the attention, we cannot sell them anything. And what we see here is the once in a decade chance. Um, on, the, on the left side, the screen is the attention of the customer and the red is the big marketing budgets. And um, what we see on, the, on, the, on this side is that attention is shifting, but the big marketing budget's not. And this is something great. Uh, in the year 2000, when uh, Google AdWords came out with their advertisement product, the click price per keyword life insurance was one cent a click. This is now gigantic, a lot more. And I think, and everybody who does performance marketing on Google AdWords knows this, and um, it's market price now. You pay a lot for your click there. But the good news is there are um, social media outlets and channels out there that are, um, um, that are underpriced because the big marketing budgets are not there. And these are, this are especially social media that are apps and there's the attention of the customer underpriced. And here again, as I asked you a few seconds before, um, how many times are we going to talk to our customers? When I was an Allianz Sales Angel, we got a list every month uh, this, and we needed to call these people to make meetings to go and uh, sell them insurance products. We were told to sell them and everybody who laughs uh, knows what I mean. So we, we called the customer once a year, maybe twice a year when he reappeared on some list and we send them, of course, long letters and most of the times very complicated content and, you know, uh, asking for more money. Right now we have an explosion of touch points, an explosion uh, of uh, this new social media and new applications and new mobile internet what we are seeing uh, around the world. And this is actually good news because we as an industry who, you know, 10 years, 15 years ago, we only had a chance to give them a call or write them a letter. We can now become parts of the daily life of our customers. And we need to do this. Why? Because the others are doing it right now. The others are sending 10,000 messages each day to us and we need to, to become part of that, that too. I think there are currently, and this is the biggest reason why we need to do the speed, why there is a need for speed, there are four attackers in insurance. The first, of course, the insurtex. What do we see right now? We see the mega rounds. We see the hundreds of millions poured in one company. It's Ladder, it's uh, Lemonade, We Fox, Hippo and those companies. Um, but and, and we see also um, new companies popping up. So we see second waves and third waves of Intratech like Lovebox or Bold Penguin in the US. And the big threat I personally think Intratech faces is not so much that there's suddenly 10, 20, 30 percent of our business gone. I think with the biggest threat, for example, of Lemonade entering the insurance market is not they getting a lot of market share, but that especially Asian and Chinese large insurance companies see how easy it is to enter the European market. And when they're coming, their pockets are way deeper than ours. The second um, attacker here are these tech companies, Google, Facebook, Alibaba. Why are they so dangerous? They're dangerous out of two reasons. First, they're dangerous because they know how to disrupt. So when Jeff Bezos sits down and says, I'm going for this industry, then they have a master plan, they go into it and they're going into it ruthless. Amazon did not let alive any single serious online book dealer. And I'm sure, I'm sure when they go into other industries, they won't do it neither. And they're very good at disrupting themselves. When engineers came to Jeff Bezos and showed him the Kindle and the business guy said, we cannot do this, this will destroy our book revenue. Jeff said, well, better we destroy our book revenue than others do it. So, and we, I know the insurance industry is known for a lot of things, but we are not very known at disrupting others or even ourselves. And another um, uh, threat the, um, tech, uh, the, the tech giants have is 
they pour a lot of money into research and development. Amazon spends $22 billion in research and development and Google 15% uh, of its revenue, which is 16 billion um, US dollar in um, research and development. This would be just to say, um, to have an example, Allianz making 130 billion, they would need to spend almost 20 billion US dollar in research and development and technology. And I think this is a uh, numbers that, that really, really, really should make uh, um, us understand how dangerous these tech giants are. Then a big attacker are also incumbents. What I see in the last two years are especially mid-sized and smaller players who out of some reason suddenly really um, do a lot of innovation, think about new business models, have a lot of projects under the radar going on and suddenly a lot of positive examples pop up and they are growing over the market average. So I think that incumbents are also uh, in one of the four attackers of the insurance industry. And last but not least, the reinsurer. I always say the reinsurers are a little bit like the Darth Vader's. Um, of the insurance industry. Of course, they have problem of uh, lowering margins due to certain market conditions, but a few are officially or even behind the scenes working on ecosystems, on technology that um, you know, in, in tendency could also replace uh, parts of the direct insurer. So that are the four attackers. And I think that's the reason why we need to be so super uh, speedy and because others are entering our space. Yeah, and now, comes the slide, um, um, why we should not be agile, or what do I mean with this? So, I experienced in my career two causes of death of projects. One was the death by planning, the death by committee, and the other one was the death by agile. Um, who of you guys has experienced a, a death of, of, of a project, a death by planning? And sign, okay, a few. Who has experienced the death by agile? So, what do I mean with that? Um, when I, um, we, we go to also uh, insurers and do projects, and what, I, what we always, um, uh, we, we have also a look at, well, how do they do projects? And uh, what we see uh, often is that several years there are projects that only lead to the requirements, for example, in IT or in the optimizing processes. So we have a book of uh, 500, or the biggest book was 900 pages of requirements, where every single button and technology was already um, predefined and in the moment that was finished after two and a half years, most of it was already outdated. So millions and millions and millions of dollars are wasted and lost by it. On the other hand, you have the death by agile. Um, the other extreme is where I worked at a startup and there was no transparency, no planning, every head did whatever he wanted. And, and when um, we tried to do transparency um, and uh, do some planning, uh, the biggest argument was always, no, it's not agile, we cannot do it. But also there, millions and millions and millions and millions were lost. So um, I think my, my, my principle, what I think that's super important is, I think it doesn't matter if you label, if you label yourself as traditional, if you label yourself as agile, uh, my, by the way, Dutch grandmother, they taught me what's super important, it's common sense. I think it's super important, the common sense principle. Maybe you can invent some nice buzzword later on at the, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a coffee or something. Um, I think it's super important that you have the right people, with the right mindset, the right skills, at the right time, at the right place. And it doesn't matter if you uh, write their, what they do up in the PowerPoint presentation, in a boring uh, uh, text document, or with sticky notes on the wall. Doesn't matter. Um, you need to have the right people and to combine both some of the planning, some of the agile to really push things forward. And now come a few hacks uh, um, what we do. So we were in a project with a um, insurer and um, I then asked that we have always look at the project portfolio, for, especially when they say, oh, we do digital. We have 500 million in our digital transformation project portfolio. And we have a look at the project portfolio. And then mostly at the end of the folder like this, there are these projects that have uh, staff allocated by 10 to 20%. And sometimes like, oh, let's change this button and it takes two years. And uh, then I am um, asked the first time, I was really spontaneously asked the guy, uh, the, the CTO was asked, um, how do you guys actually, what is the standard process of killing a project? And he was like, we don't kill projects around here. And I'm like, mm, okay. And then I said, okay, what would happen if a person would come into the room right now, put a gun to your head and you needed to kill 30% of your projects? Which one would it be? And uh, he, first he was a little bit irritated because of the picture, but then we sat down and we, you know, on paper killed 30% of the projects. And then what we actually did in reality, later on, a large portion of this 30% also were killed, which means discontinued. 
And what happened was they didn't do it before because, you know, somebody loses face and, you know, somebody didn't fulfill the plan. But we did it uh, and what the effect of it in the end was relief. Relief because even, you know, managing a portfolio of dead projects costs a lot of resources, a lot of senseless meetings, a lot of administrative costs, and these people could start over and do actually new stuff. So, uh, Celebrate Failure, this is Good Game Studios, the startup I worked for. So what did we do there? There were large investment projects, and to develop a computer game is super complicated, and to be um, successful with it, it's like, it's super, super hard. Marked is ruthless, low entry barrier for others, the desire of the customers change like every two seconds. Uh, we had a large um, investment uh, um, product development um, pro project there that, you know, failed. And we actually, you know, killed the project because we had like regular like, structures and processes for it. Um, and we actually, a uh, standard thing we did for killing a project was giving a party to the team. Why? Because we wanted that the um, team on the next Monday when they come back to work are super motivated for the new project. And we also didn't kick out the project lead, but most of the times he could continue. I think that's super, super important to ce celebrate, ce celebrate. But don't get me wrong, you know, it's not about if somebody or some team messes up all the time uh, out of reasons that are internally to celebrate them. No, no, no. It's about those um, projects that fail because um, some of external factors and external things here. Then sometimes uh, people ask me, okay, Robin, um, my staff, it's very nice that you tell all of this and I know this and I really think it's also uh, true and everything is fine. But Robin, to be honest, my staff is uh, in average 43 years old, 18 years in the company and that's actually a good thing. Uh, and now you come with all this new stuff. Um, this will cost us a tremendous amount of money to enable and to um, educate the workforce and to take them along with our way. What do you think uh, my answer to that is? How much, how expensive is it to, um, to educate a workforce? For free, you said? Ah, okay, you, you, you got obviously my, uh, my point here. Yeah, I think it's for free. The knowledge of the world is out there. You don't need an army of consultants, an army of coaches coming into your company and explaining you stuff that you can find also on YouTube. So um, when you're a decision maker, I strongly think you can save a lot of money if you found like a YouTube university where you curate your, um, the best content in the net. May it be chat talks, may it be keynotes, may it be how-to videos, may it be funny videos, doesn't matter. And, and I think um, you can, you know, enable that. And I think that's super important. And another thing is generate content for your employees yourself when you're a decision maker um, to really think about what kind of uh, knowledge should they have and, and really go for that and enable them with that. And again, my main point here, the knowledge of the world is for free. It's out there. There's no excuse to do it. And then and the costs are also no excuse because the costs are minimal. Of course, you know, to enable a host developer to, you know, Java, I know it's that, you know you don't find everything on YouTube but my main point is large large amounts um, you do and you can find in the internet and you can actually enable you, your staff for free then sometimes when we're in projects then they say okay Robin and, and maybe it's most of the time it's like after you know several days together and they say Robin you know all these new things what you want to do and what you what the world is changing I was not born with it I did not grow up with it and my answer is neither did I it's just you sit down, you do it, you learn. And the funny thing is, um, who of you has children? Okay, so you, you, you know, the, you can feel the story now. Um, when my daughter learned to walk, um, she like fell down a lot of times and probably when I learned to walk, me too, but I can't remember. And you know, she never stood up and said, ah, this is not for me. I didn't grow up with it. I wasn't born with it. She just tried and tried and tried. And now, you know, she runs around and I even can keep up with her. And I think this is the same. There's no excuse for not transforming the workforce. There's no excuse in age. There's no excuse in anything because um, the most people work, walking on the earth of this planet and that are in the insurance industry or even in tech industries, um, they didn't grow up with it. Mark Zuckerberg didn't grow up with social media, but even though he founded Facebook. So there's no excuse there. Um, apps rule attention. Has anybody an idea what was the most successful app in the year 2000 when the iPhone came out. It was an app that uh, simulated you drinking beer. All right, everybody who laughs remembers that one. 
And I had it too, I, I need to confess, I had it too. What does it mean? It means that back in the days it was super, super easy to have success in the App Store and to provide the customer's value there. And last year alone, 194 billion apps were downloaded. Today, to get the attention of the customer via an app is super, super, super hard and you need to develop a killer app. And that's also the reason why a lot of insurance and bank apps fail.